But good afternoon, and if you haven't, and if I hadn't had a chance to meet you yet, uh, my name is Joe Mask, the new Executive Vice President for the Beef Master Breeders Association, or Beef Master Breeders United. And um, when Colin knew that I was coming on board, he called me and said, hey, do you mind doing a program at the convention? And I'm like, well, no, I'll, I'll do a program. What do you need me to do? And when it's all said and done, I think I've got about seven of them to do. Uh, but that's okay. And so the first thing I want to do this afternoon is just kind of talk a little bit about what I'm thinking when it comes to what does it mean to be a seed stock producer. Because I think that that means a lot of different things throughout the industry. And everybody's location is different. Uh, where you live, uh, what your plan is, and what do you concentrate on, you know? And so as we go through it, this is just my thoughts about what it is to be a seed stock producer. I'll arm wrestle you if you want to change things, that's fine, okay? But I think these are just the common deals that we need to be looking at. And then I'll also talk to you a little bit about what I talked about in the board meeting and some of my vision uh, as we're moving forward with BBU. And um, those that are not in the, the um, we're not in the board meeting this morning, uh, I will let you know that uh, the move to College Station is on target. Uh, we'll make the first move November 1st. Uh, the building's ready. We're working on right now this week. In the first to next week to finish the IT, uh, the phone system, computers, and all of that. And um, we'll make the first move from Bernie on November 1st, and then the final move December 19th. And my goal is, is to make it is with the least amount of disruptions to the membership. We can have some growing pains in the office, but we want to make sure the membership has no issues. And the first thing that we're doing is we're going to keep the phone number the same. Okay, we're transferring the 210 number uh, to College Station through the system, so you're not going to have to remember a new phone number. We will have a new P.O. box uh, that you'll be mailing stuff to, and uh, Gerilyn's working on a postcard right now for that, and so we'll have that ready uh, to go out to the membership so you'll know, you know where to mail your paperwork off to and where we're going to be located. Um, you know, the best part about it is, is we're kind of starting from square one in this building. It's a multi-unit um, building, but it's got new carpet, it's got new paint, it's got new offices, okay? But we're still going to give you the same quality work that BBU is known for when we move. Okay. The other thing I'm going to welcome you to College Station with is to always come by when you're there. Transova is not that far. Repro Logics is not that far. So you, I, I saw the look on your face. I wasn't supposed to start with Transova first. I'm sorry. But Transova, Repro Logics, Bovine Elite, you know, whatever. If you're in town, stop by. It's your office, and we want you there. Okay. And the other thing is, is we're going to have a quite uh, a, a larger conference room. So if committees want to meet there at the office, they're going to have that opportunity as well. Okay. And so a lot of things in moving and, and, and things that are going on. But I'll promise you that uh, it's my goal is once again for the least amount of disruptions. And so we're hoping that we're going to get this done. And then, you know, six months from now, you're not even going to know we're not in Bernie. Okay. So I kind of start... Um, this afternoon and and as I was looking at you know what are the main goals of a seed stock producer and one of the things that um, I visited with Lance about is Lance did an article in the Cowman probably a year ago or so with some of this same stuff and one of the things that uh, as a past educator of 20 something years is to make sure that things are out in front of you all the time and that you keep remembering and keep thinking about it but one of the first things is the purpose of a seed stock industry is to produce cattle that will help the commercial cattle producer more profitable. We know that we've got issues across the U.S. right now. We've got some places flooding out. We've got some places that, you know, hadn't had rain in a while. Okay, but that's going to turn back around. We know that we've sold off a lot of numbers. But a year from now, we're not going to two years from now, we're going to see an increase. So we've got to be ready as, as, as beef master producers to have those females and bulls ready to sell to the commercial cow man that's been selling off cows. The best part about a drought, in my opinion, is, is we get rid of the cows we should have got rid of five years ago. You know, it forces us to. You know, at... Um, 
we run a, a, a smaller operation, my daughter and wife and I, and um, we had a cow when she came in for palpation, and I palpated her, she was open. And I told my wife, I said, well, it's time for her to go. No, you remember, you remember last year, we didn't have mineral out one time, and maybe we didn't feed them good enough, and maybe body condition score. I said, okay, she can stay around. The second year, she came in for palpation. She's open again. And I said, you know, it's time for her to go. Well, you remember, you know, we had a hard summer that year, and you know, we didn't have a lot of grass, and maybe we'd give her one more chance. The third year, I palpated those cows when she was out of town. I knew what, what I was going to feel again. And so I think that those are the things that people are doing right now, and they're going to be ready for us to have those females and those bulls ready for them to make more profit when this thing turns back around. And it's going to turn back around, okay, sooner or later. Know your target audience. Are you selling replacement females? Are all your calves going to the auction barn? Are you retaining ownership through the feedlot? What is your project at home and what is your goal? You know, at the end of the day, I would encourage you that just going to the cell barn is probably not the best option in some ways. Maybe retain ownership of those cattle, maybe feed them. The data that just came back, and we're not gonna share it all right now because I hadn't looked at it. Colin, have you looked at all of it yet? But the, the cattle that were just killed, the BBU had a hand in feeding them and owning them through the process, came back phenomenal. I mean, it's unbelievable how those cattle graded. So there's an option if you can hold off. But a lot of times I hear these people right here, well, I got a bank note, to, I got a bank note, so I got to go to sell them at the sale barn. Work with the banker and say, hey, work with me, let's feed them. See what they'll do. These cattle will grade. Okay, and they can bring some money in. But you gotta figure out, what is that target audience? And then remember, remember, how do you help improve the bottom lines of your customers? Just like over here. One of the things that I'm gonna push quite a bit um, is for BBU to start a mentorship program. And what I mean by is, is if we look at statistics and breed associations, most new breeders stay in for five years because they get frustrated. They don't have help. They don't understand why they're not selling $15,000 bulls when they just bought a $15,000 bull. The reason is, is because they don't have longevity. They don't have a name. They don't have someone helping them. And so I'm gonna push to start some type of mentorship program with you know, experienced BBU breeders to help out other breeders, especially new guys and ladies. The other thing is if you sell a bull, try to be in contact with that person. Visit with them. Hey, how's everything going? You know, can I help you with something? Because that, number one, retains that buyer for you, but it also keeps them in the breed. And we want to maintain the breed, but at the end of the day, I want to grow the breed. And so I think that's gonna be very important as we move forward. Now, I'm a guy that, um, that worked with a lot of youth over the years. And every day I get up, I have a to-do list. It stays in my pocket, okay? It's because number one, Dr. Perkins, I'm getting old and I can't remember anymore. And number two, I set goals for every day. What do I need to accomplish at the end of the day. What do I need to have done to make this work? So the fact is that you cannot hit a target that you cannot see. If you do not know where you're going, you'll probably end up somewhere else. You have to have goals. And I think as a seed star producer, when you sit down with your family, you sit down with your employees, what is your goal, okay? And you need to have, seed stock producers need to have one year goals, three year goals, five year goals. What's the low hanging fruit that you can get done in one year? Maybe that's to sell the first high dollar bull that you've ever sold, or maybe that's to produce, you know, quality females that are sought after. But what can you do on your own operation? Okay, I'm telling you right now, if you don't write it down, you'll never achieve it. It's just, it's the name of the game. And every one of you I know in here has got a business plan, right? 
Everybody's got a business plan. Everybody knows where they need to go. And everybody knows what they need to produce. If you don't, let's start it, okay? Let's get one started as a seed stock producer. Now, everybody knows I've worked in another breed before I came here. And in our, our place, we raise Brahmin cattle, Simbra cattle, and Simital cattle, okay? That's just because my daughter shows them and that's the breeds we have, okay? But, when I got the, the opportunity and when I was teaching school, I always thought about this, the six essentials. And I got to thinking even more several weeks ago of thinking that Mr. Lassiter was way before his time when he started these. And other breeds are way behind because we all need to be looking at these six essentials, every breed. Here's one of the biggest problems that we have right now because most cattle operations in the state of Texas and in other states are less than 25 head. Husband and wife have a job in town, okay? If they've got to pull a calf, it usually happens about 6.30 in the evening when the husband's still at work and the wife has to go get them in the pen. Who wants to mess with something that has a disposition issue? Okay? The older I get, the less I want to deal with them. If I knew the memories I was making as a young person would hurt as bad as they do today, I wouldn't make as many memories. Okay? Messing with bad cows are over. But look at this. We've got disposition. We don't have problems because those cattle will work. And I think as a seed stock producer, if you have this, it doesn't really matter what she's raising. It's hereditable. It's going to go down generation after generation after generation. The next biggest thing that we all have to worry about is fertility. I told you the story about the Brahmin cow. I told you the story that my wife made every excuse in the world because you know why? The one thing I didn't tell you is she had a name. Her name was Grandma. She was the oldest cow in the place. She was the lead cow. You cannot sell a cow with a name. You put a number on them, you can sell them. But you can't sell a family heirloom that's got a name on it. Okay? But fertility is important for seed stock producers. And it's important when you're going down the road. And I don't care if it's male or female. Don't make excuses on those bulls if they have a smaller testicular development and say, well, they'll get it with time. No. It's time to put them in a steer feed out program and let them go somewhere else. I like to say Dr. Perkins are going to cooler climates, you know. <laughs> Next thing that a seed stock producer should be concerned about, once again, is making money for their, their, their clients, okay. And we still sell cattle by the weight, okay, as well. Weight's important. I'm going to encourage you as a seed stock producer to start thinking about birth weights, weaning weights, and yearling weights, and phenotype data that you can get put in our system. Confirmation. I've made a really good side living in my life of trimming feet on beef cattle. I can fix them. But guess what? I fix them today, and I still got the same customer 20 years from now because they still got the same problems. So confirmation, foot, legs, everything, we've got to be concerned about that. And I think that that's one thing that this breed does. Hardiness. How many of y'all live in South Texas? It don't get much hardier than that, does it? It's hard right now. I was just down there. These cattle have to be able to thrive, okay? Beef master cattle can thrive. Some of these other breeds, they're not as much. And then the last point of the seed stock producer is, look at those cows when you wean calves. Think about milk production, you know. Think about the amount of milk that these cows have. If they're not weaning off a calf, like the rest of your cows, what should you do as a seed stock producer with that cow? There's a truck going to the cell barn every week somewhere. And I know that's harsh, especially when we, some of us, have, have spent 
10,000, 15,000 on a cow, and she doesn't milk, guess what? Those same cows can go to the cell barn. And so we've got to start thinking about that as seed stock producers is what do we do? I'll always say that I'm a data guy. I love data. I love looking at numbers. As a seed stock producer, I'm going to encourage you to start getting that data collected. Phenotype data. Your weights. If you don't own a scale, find somebody that does. Borrow it. Okay? If you want to catch these calves at, at, at birth, the tape is... It, is just is about as close to accurate as you can get if you don't have a scale. Okay, but get those birth weights. Get your weaning weights. You know, the one thing I say about data collection is, is I want to see your data whether it's good or bad. A lot of you don't want to share bad data. Okay, I don't want to share my high school transcript with you because you probably wouldn't have hired me because it's not good data. Okay, but the thing is that bad data helps us out as well. So feel free to share it. Okay, I'm not going to go out there and pinpoint you and say, "Man, I can't believe this person." I'm not going to put your name in a presentation and say, "Look at these weaning weights from this person." But it does, it helps to try to figure out where are we at as a breed. And as a seed stock producer, I'm going to encourage you to turn that data in, whether it's good or bad. Okay. Then I'm going to encourage you to turn in accurate data. Be accurate. There's some breed associations out there that say their average birth weight is 70 pounds. They're not. But you got people out there that want to sell a bull calf at 70 pounds versus 115 pounds. So you've got to have accurate data, you know, to make these things work. We want to improve as a seed stock producer our EPDs. Our EPDs help us with breeding decisions. And then the technology that we have is important. This morning I sat in the, past, uh, the president's breakfast and I heard over and over about collecting ultrasound data. You can ask this guy right here, I believe in ultrasound data. One, because he's pushed it on me, okay? But I believe in it. Now, would I like to see harvest data too? Sure. But I don't think you're going to, you know, send your $25,000 bull to cooler climates. So we need that ultrasound data. And we're going to work as an association to come up with more places to scan. I don't want you traveling a long distance. I don't want you doing it in the summertime. And I don't want you to do it when they're under stress because we know they're going to lose IMF. But we've got to come up with ways of collecting more data and using the technology that we have. Genotypes, genomically enhanced EPDs is a tool. We need to look at it. We need to be concerned. Okay? Am, am I going to tell you I'm 100% sold on them? No, I'm not. I'll be honest. But I think it's that tool that we need to be working with as seed stock producers. So data collection is very important. Find somebody to help you do it. Okay. I travel a lot in South and Central America, and one of the things that's impressive there is, is the association provides somebody to collect your data. That's because labor's cheap. We know that's not the same thing here. But if you can get it, it's going to help you down the road. Now, as a seed stock producer, you're making bulls and females, correct? We're a maternal breed. Beefmaster is a maternal breed. And we're going to believe in cow families. Because we know there's some cow families that are going to make really good bulls. There's some that's going to make really good females. And we've got to figure that out. What, is your, what, what do you want to do? But when we're making these bulls and females, we're going to go back to those six essentials that we talked about. We want fertile females and bulls as a seed stock producer. You want to guarantee somebody when they pick up an animal from your sale or your private treaty sale at home that they have a fertile animal that's going to go out and work for them. Okay? And then stand behind them. Okay? The other thing is we want to make sure they're sound. I get pictures all the time from shipments that, that go to other countries. And it appalls me sometimes about how breeders will take pictures of cattle in tall grass and sell them. 
and then all of a sudden they get on the concrete and you look at their feet and they're terrible. We've got to make sure as a breed, and you have to make sure as a seed stock producer, that those cattle you're sending out are cattle that you would keep in your herd. Somebody said this morning, I think from Arkansas, that if it doesn't hurt you, you probably don't want to sell it. When you put something in a sale, you want it to hurt a little bit when you sell it as a seed stock producer because you're selling your best. Okay. The other thing is, are the cattle that you're wanting to sell and produce, are they functional? Do they work in the area that you want them to work in? We can look back at the research, we can look at the, the, the things that are coming out, and we know that the world is getting hotter. We know it's getting hotter, okay, across the globe. I don't know why, I'm not that smart. But I can tell you that people are gonna need ball syndicus cattle. Why not have cattle that are functional, that will grade, you know, that these people can make money with in other places as well as the U.S. Once again, we talked about weight. We talked about carcass traits. Those are what's important, I think, to a seed stock producer to know when you're shipping those animals, this is what I have. Now, one of the things I think a lot of people ask about a lot of times is, how do I market my animals? Well, that goes back to that mentorship. You know, how do you market in your areas? I think the first time, the first thing about marketing is you got to sell yourself. Okay, I know that cattle producers are resilient. We can last through anything. We can last through droughts, hurricanes, tornadoes, turn down of the market. But the one thing that agriculture producers are the worst about is patting ourselves on the back and telling our story. We don't do it. We don't tell our story, and that's why we have groups out there like PETA and HSUS that want to try to shut us down at times because we don't tell our positive story. I'm going to encourage you to tell your story. It doesn't matter if you're a person that believes in the show ring, a person that believes in carcass, a person that believes in retained ownership. You have to tell your story because people need to know what you're doing, especially in your community, your neighbors. They need to know what are you doing because all of you, before you're a cattle producer, you're a grass farmer, aren't you? That's first and foremost. As a seed stock producer, you've got to grow grass if you're going to grow cattle. But we got to tell our story, and it's got to be positive. The next thing in marketing, some of y'all have got to start using social media. It's a tool, but you got to use it. Because the young people, they don't know about email. They don't even answer emails. But they are on this social media. They're on this thing all the time. Some of you adults are too, I know. Perkins, put your phone up. Anyway, no. But that is the way that we're marketing now. It's through social media. People are looking at it all the time. Okay? And I will say that probably after I give this presentation, I'm going to look on social media, and I'm going to probably have an ad about a beef master animal. I'm going to probably have an ad about a feedlot, because this phone is listening to me all the time. I was talking to a friend of mine the other day about a new John Deere tractor. And on social media, I started getting all these John Deere ads. I'm like, I never even typed anything in my phone. They know, you know. But that social media is important. Is Mr. E.C. in here? Okay. So I said earlier, that I've been hearing this, and as seed stock producers, I think print ads are still important. And I hear young people tell me, well, print ads, that's a thing of yesterday. That's yesterday's news. Well, I don't believe that. I believe print ads are still important. I believe magazines that are, that are paper, that come to your house, are important. Because people are still looking at them. And when I get on an airplane, I don't have Wi-Fi. But I'll have four or five magazines with me, and I'm going to read them. Okay? I don't do that when I'm driving down the road. But I will in, like, an airplane. But these are important. So I would encourage you as a seed stock producer to continue print ads. Once again, that print ads helps you right here sell yourself. If you don't have a web page, I'd encourage you to have one as a seed stock producer. So you can, once again, you're selling yourself. 
you're putting the good things out there. You know, if you sell a group of calves and they bring X amount of dollars, or if you sell a group of steers and they're all choice, whatever they might be, that website helps you sell animals. Okay? And I'm going to say this one more time. Tell your story. Because it's important. There's nothing else more important, I think, as a seed stock producer than letting people know who you are. Because here's the deal. There's only about maybe 20 of you in this room that I know that I can go up and call you by name. Okay? But if I go to searching on a website and I, hear, I, I read a story about a family that's been in business for 50 years, that's important to me. Because I know there's longevity. I know that they're going to stand behind their product. Okay? If there's a business that's been in business for five years, and they tell me what they've done, I'm going to believe it. Okay? But you've got to do this in a positive light. Okay? And I think this is very important when we're marketing ourselves. Now, we all like to sell animals. I mean, that's the name of the game, right? We've got to make a profit at the end of the day. Or at least my wife wants me to make a profit. She wants a paycheck, okay? Uh, she's not here, so I can say this. I'm married to a German accountant, okay? Just about 26 years. She's now an auditor. That's worse than when she was an accountant, okay? I gotta get a PO to buy groceries, okay? I mean, I have to account for everything I do. But she likes sales as well. And so, you might just want to do private treaty sales. You might want people just come to the ranch, just buy from you there. And that's okay. You might do in-person sales. Like you're seeing somebody around and we start talking about it, you might make that sale. You might make online sales. That's the thing that's going on now. Okay? I bet you Anthony Mahosky never thought when him and Leo Casas and Doke Lambert got started that they'd ever have to look at a computer screen at a sale ran by DV Auctions or Cattle in Motion or SC Online or any of those. But that's how people buy cattle now. Because they don't want to travel or they don't have the time to travel, so they're buying online. Okay? But I think one of the most important parts when you talk about BBU that's important is right here as well. These satellite groups, marketing groups, working together, okay? We know production sales are important, but I think these other type of sales are important as well. And so as you start to look at how do you market, well, I'm gonna tell my story, but then how am I gonna sell them? And so I'm gonna work with these folks and I'm gonna see what happens. How can I do the best? And how do I get my cattle there? And I think there's a really good article that was done, or, or kind of a three-pager that was done, on how to get your cattle ready for a sale. How to make sure that they're ready to go. That's important. The newer generation of cattlemen have swapped a little bit. They really look at numbers now. Some of them look at numbers before they look at phenotype. I still think phenotype's important. I want to be able to drive in my driveway and see pretty females and rugged bulls, okay? But some people just want to see the numbers, and that's fine. That's the way they want to buy them. But we've got to make sure in sales that we're hitting, once again, the target audience, and we're selling them what they want to buy. Now, I told you about this earlier, but this mentorship program, and I haven't pinned it all out. I haven't got it all figured out yet. But, you know, find a mentor. I tell young people all the time, if you get beat by the same person in showmanship at every show you go to, go ask that person what are they doing that you're not doing. Okay? If your neighbor's selling $50,000 bulls and you're selling $2,500 bulls, go talk to your neighbor and see what they're doing. Ask them, how are you getting this done? Because guess what? We all don't know everything. But if we find that person that can help us, that's what we're going to do. I mean, I've been fortunate enough to have this guy right here as a mentor since 19... 
1991. That's a long time ago. When I first met Dr. Perkins, he was at Texas, it was Southwest Texas at that time, and I was going to go to school there. And he's the first guy I met when I went over there to talk to somebody. Didn't know who he was, he didn't know who I was. Okay. Then I found my, and then I started dating my wife and I went to Texas A&M instead, but he went to Missouri, so I wasn't going to have him anyway as a professor. But we've stayed in contact all those years, and I consider him a mentor. When I started seeing some issues with some ultrasound data I had, first guy picked up the phone and said, Doc, what do we got? You know, and now he's at one of the, the best places there is in Texas at West Texas A&M in Canyon. The program's growing there because of people like that. But it can be somebody inside BBU that can be your mentor. It can be somebody outside BBU that can be your mentor. Okay? Your neighbor might, might raise miniature longhorns. I don't know. Did y'all know that was a deal now? Miniature longhorns? Yeah. They got their own deal now. Miniature longhorns. Who would ever thought, right? But it could be somebody in another breed, another business, that you might want to have as your mentor. Go ask them questions. Listen, the worst thing that a person can ever tell you is what? No, I'm not going to help you. And guess what? Just going down the road because you don't want their help anyway. Okay? But find that person. It can actually even be a coworker that you talk to every day and you might just run an idea by them and they might tell you that you're crazy. Well, that's okay. Maybe you want to tweak it some. But I think mentors are important. This is kind of what I live by right here. Build a great team. No one is an expert in everything. The strongest business are built on the smartest people, not on one person. I surround my people, myself with people that are better than me. Okay? Makes me look better. Because that's what it takes. And I think as a seed stock producer, that's what you have to do. Surround yourself with people that are going to make you better. If you're satisfied selling $1,500 females, then that's good. But how many would y'all like to sell females for more money than that? Okay. Find somebody to help you. The why is more important than the what. Why are you in business? Why are you in the beef master cattle business? Have you ever asked yourself that? Have you ever just thought, why do I do this? And then wrote down why? Have, have any of y'all ever done that? You can raise your hand. This ain't church. Y'all never asked yourself why? I mean, I understand. I can look right there at Lorenzo Lasner and I know why he is in the beef master business. He'd probably get kicked out of the family if he started raising Angus tomorrow. Okay? That's the why. But have you ever thought about that? Why does Anthony Mahoski sell cattle? Why? Why does the Emmons family run up and down the road with their grandkids showing cattle? They ask, their, they ask that question all the time. Why are we doing this? Okay? Especially when they're sitting in line at Houston for 14 hours just to try to unload. But the why is more important than the what. What you do during the day is, is important. But why are you doing it? Have you thought about that as a seed stock producer? If you haven't, I encourage you to go home and write down why you're doing what you're doing. Along with those goals. I'm going to tell you right now, you'll be more successful. Okay? Because every day you're going to look at that. And you're going to stick to the plan. Okay? And it might take you 40 years to reach the goals, to understand as a seed stock producer why you're doing it. But you're going to figure it out. Unleash your imagination. What do I mean by that? Unleash your imaginations. How many of y'all think, oh, I can't do that? I can't do that. Well, listen, can't's not in my vocabulary. I'll try it now. I might mess up. It might not work the first time. But you've got to think outside the box nowadays. Okay? How many of y'all have noticed that there's more and more people now selling their own beef at home? Why do you think that is? Why do you think producers are selling their own meat now? 
Number one is because the consumer wants it. They know where it's coming from. The consumers that we have today in urban surf, uh, cities, they want to go to a farmer's market because they think it's a better product. Those people are thinking outside the box. They're unleashing their imaginations of what can they do. Okay. Imagine the impossible as a sea star producer. You might say, oh, I can't get that done. I will tell you, you can if you try. Okay. You know, I will tell you this, and this is not to have a pat on the back. This is not to a sob story. But I will tell you this. I was voted most likely not to succeed coming out of high school. That's a true fact. I didn't like school. I didn't do homework. My high school guidance counselor said, you better stay on the ranch because you're not going to make it in college. I think I did. I let her live rent free in my head for a year and I didn't go to college. But then I went. Okay. Now I'm not telling you that for a pat on the back. What I'm telling you is, is you have to imagine the impossible in the beef cattle industry today that we're in. And you've got to look at other options out there. Okay. I would also tell you to never stop learning. I tell you to become a lifelong learner. How many of you in this room know everything? We think, we, we know we do, okay, but I mean, that's okay. But how many people know everything? Every day you've got to learn something, okay? I learn every day. I've got a 15 year old daughter, and I'm telling you, I learn something new every day. Now, some of this stuff's going around this country I don't want to know about, but I have learned every day something. And I had a professor in college named Dr. Gary Briars. And the first time I ever met Dr. Briars, the first thing he ever told me was, is be a lifelong learner. Learn every day. And I read every day. Okay? You have to do the same thing as a seed stock producer. You've got to learn every day. Then you've got to remember a good cow is the foundation for great calves that generate profit. How many of y'all have bad cows? Yeah, you ain't raise your hand now, are you? We all got them. We've all got them. They're there. Okay? But how do we improve them? Okay? How do we improve them? Number one, if they got a name, get rid of the name. Because then you can sell them. But you've got to figure out that why. Go back to the why and say, why am I doing this? Why do I think I need to be in the beef master breed? Well, I'm going to tell you why. Number one, because the cattle are profitable. Number two, they're built on a solid set of values, this breed was. And back now, that's impressive. Very impressive. Okay. That's what you've got to look at on a daily basis. Because I will tell you that for some of you, these top two deals as a seed stock producer are going to be tough. Because some of you, I can look around the room, or set in your ways. You say, I've got it made. I'm, I'm doing just what I want to do. That's okay, but you can do better. Instead of $4,000 average, next year you're going to be at $6,000 average. Then you're going to be at $7,000 average. But you've got to think way outside the box and figure, what can I do? Okay. It's possible to do that. And it's possible to do whatever you want to do. And as I said, don't let your neighbor, and I'm going to pick on, on, on the two Lissy brothers over here, don't let one of the brothers live rent-free in your head and say, you can't do it, just tell me how we're doing it, come on, get on the wagon, right? But you've got to get together and do it. That's the way that we're going to improve all of us. Okay, that's the way that we're going to improve Beefmaster. It's the way you're going to improve your association. It's the way you're going to improve your bottom line. Because at the end of the day, I want you to pay the bills. Okay? And you've got to do that. It's impressive of what's happening. And some of y'all know, I'm a show guy. I love to show cattle. We haul cattle all over the country. 
Now, do I think that's the main thing in the world? No, but I love showing. Because I'm going to tell you right now, I hate to lose worse than I like to win. I don't like to lose. But that show and competition is something that I like and our family likes because it's family time for us. Okay? It's important for a seed stock producer to sell those good females to those kids. The other thing I would tell you is you're imagining the un impossible and you're thinking outside the box, I would tell you as a seed stock producer, never think of that kid in JBBA as the future because they're not the future of our breed. Those JBBA kids are not the future at all. They're the present. We have got to quit thinking about them 10 years down the road. Think about how we're going to keep them in the breed today. Okay? And we're going to work with them, and we're going to keep them that way. Okay? Because they are going to be the next generation. So kind of in summary, I want you to think about the commercial producer. What does the commercial producer need from us as seed stock producers? They need females and they need bulls. And they need things that will work in their area. Okay? Next thing I want you to think about quality phenotype and genotypes in your cattle. As seed stock producers, I want you to think about what's the most important thing you can do when you're making your breeding selections. Or sometimes they're not going to work. Yes, they, they're not going to always work. Okay? But I will tell you, with time and time again, if you have that plan and you know where you're headed, you've got a road map. How many of y'all remember the old Rand McNally road maps? Yeah, we didn't have these. Okay, y'all haven't. Not everybody's met her, but Laurel Kelly back here in the back, she's the new um, director for or coordinator for JBBA. We were talking coming up here yesterday. You know, back in the day. You had the Rand McNally. You laid that dude out on the hood of the truck. You figured out your plan. You got in the truck and you went. Now, if we didn't have the phone, we can't get across the town to get to the HEB. Okay? Have that roadmap for your production. What do you want to do? And then third, as we summarize, talk about data collection. Get that data. Whether it's good or bad, hey, let's look at it. Let's see how can we improve. Because it's not an end, okay? Bad data is not an end. Bad data helps us, okay? We all hope in research that we get to the point where we want to be, but sometimes the research data doesn't prove that, does it? That's okay to be bad. Same thing with producing cattle, okay? And I would leave you at this, is always think outside of your comfort zone, outside of the box. The impossible, what can you do? Okay? And lastly, tell your story and sell yourself as a producer. Because that's what is important.